Again, my name is Dimitri Broxton. I'm the Senior Director of Education here at MOAD, and this is the fourth and final meeting of Art and Artists of the African Diaspora, a crash course with Dr. Jacqueline Francis. It's been such a pleasure to have this. Um, I don't want it to ever end, and I know some of you are in that same boat. It's just so, it's, it, it just feeds my soul each week. Um, and we also want to um, acknowledge Black Lives Matter and all of the lives that have been lost to uh, violence by the state in this last year and the number that keeps going. Um, as Yeva reminded us, we also want to acknowledge that even in the virtual space, our museum, our servers, and most of us who are on uh, the Zoom right now are also um, joining from the unceded Native American lands. And we want to acknowledge the peoples whose lands were stolen and the people who have also stewarded this land for generations. Um, I want to remind folks that uh, each of the sessions is available on Facebook. So if you visit Museum of the African Diaspora's Facebook, you can uh, go back and watch any of the episodes. Um, and they're also on Museum of the African Diaspora's YouTube channel. Last but not least, I also want to thank our sponsors, IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services that uh, provided funding for this program, as well as all of our amazing members. Um, and you who are not yet members, we want you to sign up and, and stay with the Moad family who've made this program possible. All right, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Jacqueline Francis. Hey everybody, good evening. Good to see you, even as I don't see you, but I see your names in the participants roster and looking forward to talking with you tonight. I just wanted us to do as we always do, just a little bit of a stretch thing and you know we're gonna move um, backwards and forwards tonight. Um, I'm gonna have Dimitri in a minute, not right now, um, put up some slides that we didn't get to last week when we were talking about the ways in which artists have been defining um, diaspora through their work. Um, but um, tonight we're gonna talk about uh, carnival and performance. So I think it's maybe appropriate for us to like jump or something like that, just like we were in carnival, like literally, I don't wanna make you dizzy by jumping too fast on camera, but let's spend like a minute, like just even marching, you know? In uh, Trinidad, they talk about the ways that um, carnival goers, um, their feet hit the pavement and they call it chipping because it sounds like when dozens and hundreds and thousands of feet are hitting the pavement, that it's going a chip, chip, chip. So you let's just do a little chipping, a little movement. We'll go for another uh, 45 seconds. Okay, let's all come back and Dimitri's going to load up the um, slide deck from last week's um, discussion of defining diaspora. I just wanted to go back to the work of Renee Stout and to also to the work of Nick Cave because we kind of rushed through it. Um, so he's going to share his screen. Um, he's got the slide decks and then we'll start with uh, the first slide we saw of Renee Stout. Great, thank you so much, Dimitri. It's been so helpful to have you do these slides um, throughout the weeks. So um, remember that last week, those of you who are here or uh, watched it online, um, we were talking about the ways that the contemporary artist Renee Stout, still living, um, born in 1958. Um, last I know, she was still living and working in um, Washington, D.C., um, had studied the form of the Minkisi. 
Um, that is to say, um, she studied this um, ritual West African um, sculptural practice. And it's even more than a practice because it involves not just an artist and the audience for the artist, but it also involves a, a person who's an intervener in a, in a way in terms of working with the artist and the person who commissions the sculpture. So we're looking at her work from 1988, uh, Fetish Number no. 2, which some of you astutely noted last week, um, obviously is part of a series um, of works called fetish. And some of you even started to think about her, her way of um, using that term fetish in a very self-conscious way, um, in a way that sort of embraces um, both the idea that a fetish is something that we um, can't stop thinking about, that we fixate upon, um, but also has been used in ways um, that are definitely um, culturally constricting um, and in ways that people um, oftentimes from outside of um, uh, cultures that look at traditional sculpture as fetishes often say, oh, well, fetishes are part of a superstition. Let's talk about maybe if we go to the next slide, um, you know, we could easily talk about painting as a superstition or as a fetish, especially when we think about the contemporary commodity market. Um, as we did last week, um, I just wanted you to think about and to look at work by um, Stout um, before she started to do um, the fetish series. Um, you're looking at her uh, painting um, of 1983, uh, Hanging Out, as well as another painting of about 1985 called Mollet. And as was the case with, um, we talked about Wifred Alam, uh, we talked a little bit about Aaron Douglas. I think it's really important to see um, what an artist um, maybe did before the work that becomes the focal work, the focal point. Um, so I just wanted us to see the ways in which she's um, working in a sort of expressionist um, and realistic way. And when I use those terms expressionist and realistic, um, I'm thinking about the ways that the paintings um, have this bright color, a very bright palette, um, um, not entirely naturalistic, exaggerated. That's one of the characteristics of expressionisms. Um, that it, they're bold, um, they're graphic, um, they're very strong in terms of the palette, a lot of primary colors, as well as um, the idea that um, she is uh, working in um, thinking about uh, realism, that is to say, um, you recognize um, the people, you recognize the background in hanging out. It is something that is doesn't seem um, abstracted totally nor beyond what we can imagine. Um, uh, similarly with Mollet, the sauce um, that is there um, presented with Heinz ketchup, you know, it looks like a bottle of a condiment. Um, so, but we can see that she's sort of playing with it. There's a little bit of um, exaggeration there. Um, there's something about the hyper realism of Mollet um, as if she's uh, making these things almost fetish-like as well. Um, of course, you know, we also want to think about modernity in terms of thinking about um, what Stout is doing uh, with um, the commodity culture, the mass produced um, mullet sauce, the mass produced Heinz ketchup um, as something that is economic and technological modernity. Um, and maybe to some extent, um, these uh, men who are in this genre piece, that is to say, a painting of everyday life as modern subjects as well. And we could maybe make a contrast between the way she's presenting herself, maybe as a subject that's not within a quote, modern time space, a contemporary time space, maybe that figure um, of her own body as it's cast in fetish number two seems to be of a timeless space. Let's go to uh, the next slide. I just wanted again for you to see uh, what Stout herself looks like. Um, here's a, a, a still from a video that she did um, in uh, the start of the new millennium um, called um, I Can Heal. I haven't seen this video. I haven't been able to get at it in total, but um, I think it's online, at least in parts. It seems like it's only six minutes, um, but uh, I have to do some more research about it. I'd be interested to hear if anybody else here tonight has seen it.
So you get a sense of her scale, even as she's sitting at her work table, um, her interest obviously in um, sculptural objects, both three-dimensional things, as well as um, things that are like relief sculpture on the wall behind her. So it's interesting to see her move from working in a two-dimensional practice with painting um, into sculpture. Uh, the next slide, um, just again, so that you're thinking about, you know, what's important to her um, to just uh, scan this very long text quote by her. So um, I want us to think about not only in the ways in which um, she's speaking from the first person perspective, what she's trying to do, but also this idea that she uh, puts out is that she's trying to construct narratives, that is to say stories, um, stories of marginalized people, stories uh, that haven't been told, um, and also stories that seem to be um, maybe from a different worldview. Um, and what she wants to do by um, presenting these stories to us is um, take us to a state where she is at or she hopes to get at, that is to say, a state of empowerment. So just about a key word that we've talked about in addition to modernity, you know, thinking about the idea of narrative as storytelling as something that can happen um, not only in, um, in terms of literature, but also in terms of the visual arts. So the next slide, um, we see the objects that um, have inspired her, the Minkisi, these objects uh, from uh, Central African regions um, in the Congo, um, uh, where they are used um, as power figures. Um, that is to say, figures that are um, presented um, to advance a person's um, um, ambitions in a way. Um, I talked about last week, uh, what happens is that with this functional work, um, that is to say, it's a, obviously it's an object, it's a vessel, it's a statuette of a human figure. Um, it can also be wrapped in layered in cloth. Um, it can also be non-figurative. It could be a bundle of things um, all wrapped up in clay pouches. Um, some of the fetishes can um, also be even clay pots, literal vessels. Um, and to all of these kinds of forms, what we know is it's not just the sculptural form itself, but what's done to it in terms of what's inside of the cavity, um, what's smeared on it in terms of herbal substances, um, medicines, clay, et cetera. And the way that the work is that then um, seen as it is being, um, it is being um, blessed by a, a, a healer, a doctor who is a, a functional um, a, a ministerial like person, a religious uh, person, as well as someone who knows about the power of herbs. So the idea is that the living energy from the medicines, as well as the actions related to the Nkisi, it's Nkisi in singular, Minkisi in plural, um, is what activates the sculpture, right? And in Kisi itself, just in terms of uh, the Kikongo language is often translated as medicine. So it's a container of forces directed towards some kind of desired end. Um, just checking to see, was there a question about this in the chat? Yeah, in Kisi and media yeah, medicine, yep. The image presents a good sense of Renee's scale, but she wears her hair a lot, so yeah. The Afro suggests a different follicle performance. Nice, nice, nice job, um, uh, Veronica, with that. So the Nkisi is made in stages. That is to say, a person who wants something to happen, uh, wants some directional change, or maybe wants protection, goes to a healer, a doctor, to seek advice from somebody, um, maybe in order to uh, get protection, as I said, or maybe wants to um, ensure a happy marriage, or maybe wants to um, set um, um, in motion, positive and advantageous business dealings, or maybe they're trying to repair a wrongdoing, um, goes to see to uh, this healer doctor who says, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to order one of these wooden figures, this Nkisi, which has a physical aspect of a sculpture, but it isn't an Nkisi yet. It's not empowered nor potent until the healer gets a hold of it and then 
starts to apply the substances to it, the herbs, the soil, the clay, maybe um, bones, maybe ashes, maybe seeds, maybe some ancestral objects. Um, these are the things that, the, uh, that make the Nkisi empowered and enacted. So uh, last week, I remember too that, um, you know, I said um, to make a point, and I'm interested, you know, if it came across as um, persuasive that, um, you know, the Nkisi is this thing that is being made for, um, obviously it has a visual power. It has a, a, a sculptural power. It is an artwork, but it is put into instrumental um, purposes. And I'm saying that, you know, with Stout, you know, she is borrowing from the making of the Nkisi. She is replicating it life-size um, in order to make this um, sculpture that is, you know, human height. But, uh, you know, I think that it's also about the Nkisi is going to um, be seen in a public setting. It is going to be seen in a museum or a gallery space. It is going to be photographed. It is operating in a, a world that's a little bit different um, in terms of fetish number two, it's operating in a world that's a little bit different than the Nkisi that is a relationship between um, a commissioner, um, a healer doctor, and an artist. Uh, someone has a good question about Nkisi is a male creation made by men only. Interesting that she uses her body and a female am embodiment uh, and are those amulets, yes, that adorn her person, yes. Yeah, that is the thing I'm trying to bring up too is that, yeah, indeed, she is using her own body. Let's turn around uh, to go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, um, uh, Dimitri, thank you, is to think about the ways in which, you know, she is presenting her own body to scale. Um, she is doing something that um, is very um, uh, revealing in terms of her own form. Um, and she is uh, doing something with a female body, um, clearly with the Nkisi. It does not look um, like a male body. Um, can Black American artists culturally appropriate from West Africa, Calandra? Let's open that up. <laughs> is appropriation the verb here? What is the, you know, this is a, you know, we could talk about this uh, for quite some time. Or is it adoption? Excellent counterpoint from uh, Eva Johnson. Yeah. What is the meaning of diaspora, right? So diaspora is the idea that um, it's uh, the idea of flight or scattering right, um, that ideas and people um, who carry those ideas move from the place where they started and go to a new place, oftentimes taking those ideas, taking those rituals, taking those customs, taking those very ways of thinking with them. But if it's not your cultural an ancestry, how can it be adoption? Does this travel in our spiritual DNA? Yeah, you know, speaking of that, this is what uh, Betty Sarr says, if we go to the next, um, slide, um, Betty Sarr talks about, she feels that, um, you know, working in a certain way is part of her DNA um, in terms of the memories of um, the middle passage. Um, you know, again, this is what is meaningful to her. I do think um, to answer the uh, question that started us off is, you know, in the 1920s, um, there was a philosopher who was an art patron. He was literally a person who was not only um, a collector, but also a curator who worked uh, tirelessly to promote the work of uh, artists of African descent who were in the United States, as well as um, work by people of African descent, such as um, traditional African sculpture that he himself collected named Elaine Locke. Elaine Locke, and some of you might have heard of him before. Um, and Locke wrote this essay that called, was called The Legacy of the Ancestral Arts. And about this uh, essay he wrote, he said that African-American artists who were working in the contemporary period of the 1920s were missing the boat. He said, look at the, what the European artists, the white American artists um, as well, have learned from looking at 
traditional African sculpture and especially African sculpture. I don't think a lot of these artists that we think about in terms of European modernism were looking at um, African textile extensively, nor were they looking at African architectures. Um, they were looking at the sculpture that had started coming into uh, Europe and to some extent into North America from the late 19th century. Some of it bought, some of it looted, some of it stolen, um, some of it um, bartered for um, by colonial officials in Africa. And this work really, um, you know, blew their minds because not only were they thinking about um, different ways that um, African artists were uh, working in terms of handling the figure because they were especially interested in sculpture, handling form, the kinds of materials they used, et cetera. But they brought their varied, but oftentimes very culturally stereotyped notions of what power was in the work. And I think, um, you know, to Locke's point, you know, these artists did not speak any African languages. Anthropology was a new field. Ethnography hadn't even thought been thought about yet. All they were looking at was the formal body, body uh, the formal work itself, the formal objects. In any case, Locke said, even though he believed that a lot of these works were not known to artists of African descent by DNA, nor you know, the traditions that these works had been made um, through were known to them, he exhorted artists of African descent in the United States to study this work. He said, go to the museums, because the work is in the Metropolitan Museum of the 1920s already. It is in the Art Institute of Chicago. You know, it is in the Brooklyn Museum. These are places that started to collect and display African art in the early 20th century. And even private collectors, some of them who were Black Americans, had modest collections of African sculpture. He said, study this work because the Europeans have learned something in terms of modernist tactics of art making, which they usually translated into painting, but some did in sculpture um, like Epstein and others, right? He says, there's something that's really powerful about the formal qualities of this work, separate even from how it's used in the world. So. My point to the question that came up uh, before was appropriation. What does it mean? Yeah? Someone said adoption, right? Is that what it is? You know, I think it's I think it's learning and studying. You know, I really do think, you know, this is my point about David Hammonds and others. It's literally about learning and studying something and saying, how do I make it? for my purposes in my time. How do we adopt something that is collectively ours? Yeah, Remy has that good question, yeah. And you know, what are the different cultures? You know, I mean, a lot of us have been doing these, um, uh, the uh, DNA tests, et cetera, right? Um, uh, does it matter if it seems like your background is mostly West African and yet you're using this um, art form that's from Central Africa, you know? Uh, to the point that I do want to make as well about the way the which the body is being um, used, um, I wanted us to think about Betty Sars, The Liberation of Aunt Jemima, and I talked a lot about that last week. And, I bet a lot of you maybe have seen it, especially if you're here in the Bay Area because it's at the Berkeley Art Museum here in uh, California. And remember that I said that she was, that is to say Betty Saar was very much influenced by um, the assemblage practices of Joseph Cornell, whose work you're seeing there in the middle, Joseph Cornell, a white New York City based artist um, who started to make these works that were not about um, obviously uh, something that was uh, crafted in terms of um, uh, with the hand in terms of painting or sculpture, but was using found objects. And remember, we talked about that uh, earlier um, um, in the course, um, and then presenting them in um, um, these boxes, which in a way kind of creates a sense of not only collection as if you're a kid collecting marbles, but also a different way of presenting something from the picture in the frame 
or the drawing in the frame, right? The, the art object not only becomes um, um, three-dimensional, right? Because a box has depth but it also becomes something that speaks to this notion of stuff that's brought together by an artist who's interested in the formal um, potential of things being brought together. Um, so SAR creates this um, uh, shoebox sized uh, um, um, sort of Aunt Jemima to the multiple um, almost shrine uh, with uh, uh, the liberation of Aunt Jemima. Um, it's got pictures of Aunt Jemima. It's got um, a mirror lining the block, box so that the image of Aunt Jemima becomes reflective and reiterated and multiplied. Um, you know, uh, I think Veronica last week asked about flash of the spirit. This is one of the things that, you know, um, Robert F. Uh, Farris Thompson is talking about, like the use of the mirror, the use of glittery things, the use of um, things that will reflect um, and even refract light. Um, she's also, of course, using the sort of grid format that we could think about in terms of um, pop art and work by Andy Warhol in the 1960s. And she's also making substitutions, right? She's found these objects um, uh, like uh, these um, uh, pencil holders. I think we could go to the next one. Dimitri, um, she's thinking about um, Minkisi sculpture. I'm, I told you last week that um, she had heard a lecture by Arnold Rubin, who was teaching at UCLA, um, an Africanist, um, talk about accumulation, um, power and display in African sculpture. Um, and she decides, how do I show power and display? I'm not going to show Aunt Jemima as a um, retiring, servile, um, 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 insipid figure. I'm going to show Aunt Jemima as armed with a toy rifle. I'm going to show Aunt Jemima whose um, skirts, and if you look at the, uh, the inset there into the box, has become a fist. She's made out of a cutout of a brown colored fist um, that she uh, makes the skirt, um, which is of course a sign of not only labor power, but black power in the 1960s and the 70s. She's brought in cotton balls, right, which makes you think of, oh, Oh, this is the Aunt Jemima antebellum space of the South. And then there are these cocoa pods, which also um, make us think about another kind of crop. Um, that is to say, uh, cacao, that is something that uh, is, is widely grown um, in terms of um, uh, West African uh, agriculture. Um, it, it is the seed form for our, our, our chocolate um, that uh, we, uh, we make today. Um, and I think there's something here about parody and um, as well, I did see that our uh, Aunt Jemima just got a new name, the Pearl Manning Company. Yeah, I gotta have to uh, read more about that. If we can go to the next slide, <laughs> um, to, to Dimitri uh, and hit advance once please. Yeah, so uh, this idea of the servant, right, um, becomes not only um, um, insipid with this um, strange lithograph, chromolithograph that she has here, but it also becomes um, deracinated from uh, this um, uh, racist stereotype. If you could hit the slide one more time, Dimitri, advance. Yeah, so these um, notepads um, with the sort of racist stereotype of the absurdly grinning servant um, who is there to serve you um, as you write up your grocery list. Um, so let's go to the next one then. So, you know, SAR is recycling the image of uh, the uh, Aunt Jemima um, brand name spokesperson, making uh, her a warrior, right? And she is an upright figure um, in the liberation of Aunt Jemima. I just wanted us to think about, as we went through last week, um, rather quickly, the way that we see the nude, and I put the nude as a key phrase for us to think about, um, as a reclining figure, as a figure that is oftentimes either lying down um, or sitting um, in terms of being a subject, a motif um, for artists um, over centuries in terms of European and European American traditions. So to think about the uprightness, not only of Aunt Jemima who's clothed, but think about the uprightness of um, Renee Stout here in fetish number two. Um, 
I could have thought about a number of nudes. I went back and forth, um, uh, which ones I wanted to show to you, but uh, uh, I could have showed a different Manet if we go to the next slide. Uh, some of you know, of course, uh, Manet's uh, painting, Olympia. Um, another Manet work with uh, nude figures here is uh, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, uh, Luncheon on the Grass of 1863. And again, you know, just so we're thinking about what these key terms mean, um, modernity in terms of uh, Manet in the 1860s um, is talking about free love and to some extent um, feminism to some, uh, to some degree in terms of um, presenting a female figure who is in, <laughs> inexplicably naked among clothed men, but this idea that women can do that in uh, the period. Yes, Micheline Thomas has a version of this work which was commissioned by um, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York that is fascinating um, in terms of her presentation of um, black women in this um, compositional um, idea, which she transforms just by putting black figures here. Um, I also want us to think about the ways in which um, Manet in this work is um, speaking to a certain kind of modernism. And remember that one of the things I did want us to think about is the ways in which artists um, are doing things in terms of formal strategies. So in the 1860s, different from the Titian work that we just saw of the Venus of Urbino, um, notice the way that the, the uh, the picture plane is sort of strange here. Um, the distance between um, the seated group, the trio there, and the figure in the background in the spring seems kind of compressed, kind of strange. Um, Manet is doing this deliberately, not because he's a painter that doesn't understand perspective. He is saying in the 1860s that painting is putting something that is to say a medium like oil onto a two-dimensional surface. Let's stop playing like a painting is a three-dimensional surface. A painting is not in the Italian Renaissance ideal, at least to him in the 1860s. The point of it is not to create a window as if you can create a sense of depth through illusionary tactics with painting. He's like, let's talk about the flatness of painting. And so this is one of the, um, the, uh, the sort of attributes and tactics of modernist painters like um, uh, Manet. And the last uh, two things, last things I want to say about this in terms of the, the, the way that uh, Manet kind of jumbles together a bunch of different kinds of um, genres within Western painting. So we have the figural group, we have in the foreground a still life, right, of their luncheon um, basket. That is to say, a still life is a kind of painting that often presents food um, in terms of jugs of wine, fresh fruit. Um, we think about the Netherlandish tradition in the 17th century, which speaks, of course, to colonial exploitation, right? Going from the Netherlands to the colonies to get tropical um, uh, fruits, to get things that couldn't be grown in Europe, to bring them back um, and to use that um, that commerce, right, to enrich um, the Dutch state and Dutch individuals. Um, the other thing that this painting has is it's a landscape, but again, it's a strange landscape. The space is kind of compressed. And the other thing, in addition to being a still life and a landscape, it is also a genre painting. It's supposed to be everyday life, an ordinary act, except, you know, it's two uh, naked, one naked, one semi-naked women um, and uh, two clothed men um, chilling out in um, a Parisian forest. Yeah, the horizon line seems a little tipped back there as well, right? So Manet is doing this really to poke a hole in these ideas that pictures are life, right? They, he's saying they are not life, actually. They are objects that are created out of the mind of the artist. Um, and so we can also think about that in terms of, you know, the Rene Stout um, body as well here, not entirely symmetrical, um, um, looking uh, very human, right? And not being idealized in terms of certain um, tactics of traditional sculpture, which were still in force in the 19th century and are still in force today in the 21st century in terms of symmetry, in terms of balance, in terms of even the medium that's chosen, right? Often marble, et cetera. 
Carmen, very much a man's fantasy for the male gaze. Yeah. Um, and, and think about, yeah, this as we move toward one of the key words I want us to think about is homoeroticism when we get to the carnival work. So next slide, please, Dimitri. So last week, um, uh, Veronica did a, a, a preview. She was reading my mind, thinking about the nudes. Um, Henri Matisse's series of works, uh, the backs, uh, you see here, um, these are in the collection of the Tate in London. Um, there's others um, in the Museum of Modern Art in terms of the series. Um, and so what I'm wanting you to see here is a way another artist now working in sculpture is literally learning how to abstract the body, right? So the body becomes less and less about sort of curves and um, the sensuous sort of suggestion of um, flesh and muscle and more and more becomes almost columnar like when you look at the um, image um, that is the fourth in the back um, on the far right right so he's starting to say yeah that the the body can be simplified just like the way artists learn about it uh, when you're learning to draw right is to imagine um, shapes uh, before you started to add the particularities of the body understand a column a circle a sphere right Again, thinking about the way that these nudes sit against Renee Stout's nudes in this fetish series. Um, and then going to the next slide piece, um, uh, Dimitri, um, the Faith Ringgold work, um, uh, Matisse's model. So uh, what Ringgold is doing with her kind of narrative um, uh, um, narrative agenda here is to imagine um, 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 a figure, uh, William Marie Simone, as a Black woman who's in Paris in the early 20th century and who sits or poses for a Matisse. So uh, the brown figured um, reclining figure is supposed to be Simone um, in the company of uh, Matisse, who is represented as the gray bearded, bearded bespectacled figure on the right. And this figure of Simone Simone is supposed to be um, making her way um, within the um, circles of the Parisian avant-garde, um, uh, uh, Gertrude Stein, Picasso, Matisse, and others, and imagining that she herself um, can not only um, make work like them, but she can exceed their work. So Ringel here is doing something that obviously I've been saying that artists do um, throughout uh, the semester, I think, of this course is that artists research. Um, she is um, researching the histories of a modernist um, canonical work, um, not only in terms of, you know, things that Matisse painted um, uh, that were on view, um, but also Matisse's own documentation of how he um, had uh, nude women posing for him in his um, in his studio. Um, obviously Matisse's works um, like the dance, um, which she has roughly reproduced here. And she's bringing it to this idea of the quilt as a, an African textile art, as well as one that um, is in uh, the Americas in terms of um, a famous textile um, uh, makers um, such as the Wilcox County textile makers, better known as the G's Bend um, quilters. Um, some of their works you've seen here in the Bay Area, others of you in places across the country. Uh, Charlie notes says, love the odd juxtaposition of material around the edges. Yes, um, just like Matisse would do in his paintings, right? So borrowing the sort of Matissean um, composition, um, like the red room and the studio um, in terms of that patch on the right edge. And then the other thing that um, you can't see as well is that she has the word stories exactly carried that she wrote on the top and the bottom in handwritten, um, making it give the look of the handwritten diary like um, narrative of this is what uh, Willia is experiencing in Paris. Um, and this, um, you know, the, the presentation of the nude um, Willia here in the Matisse's model is very interesting because it does seem even as she's reclining that uh, Willia is an engaged sitter, right? Willia is not a passive sitter. Willia is almost a collaborator with Matisse in this project. If we go to the next slide, um, thinking about um, Kehinde Wiley, again, another artist whose work has been seen here in the Bay Area, um, Sleep, 
of 2008, you know, a huge painting, 132 by 300 inches um, in the Rubel collection in um, Florida. And so Wiley too is looking at um, a canonical work, um, going back uh, to the work of Giraudet oftentimes and Ang. So these are artists of the 18th and the 19th century um, who are, um, artists seen as um, neoclassical artists, as well as romanticist artists. That is to say, um, romanticists in terms of the ways that they're presenting the body as this, um, um, a place, a site of um, not only thinking, but of passion, of, 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 of eros, of pleasure in terms of the form of the body, the scale of the body, the balance, right, the musculature. Um, and then as well in terms of the neoclassical, um, um, oftentimes with these artists uh, such as Giraudet, they're looking at what they are considering the European classical tradition and its roots in antiquity in terms of sculpture of um, ancient Greece and, uh, and, af and the aftermath in terms of ancient Rome. Um, and of course, with this incredibly, um, think of the luminosity of this body here that, um, um, that Wiley uh, places in front of us, right? It's the contrast to the floral background. Um, it is um, something that works in terms of the value, in terms of the difference between it's bronze-like. It becomes sculptural, not only in terms of color, but also in terms of the, the force of the body with the sort of viscousness of that wrap um, that's covering um, his genitals and covering a little bit of what he's lying on, right? It's, it's, it's often it's like a little bit of a um, um, definitely a an, an, an attachment in terms of Eros. And I don't mean that just in terms of Wiley being um, an out gay man. I'm talking about everyone looking at this body as if it is delicious. Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah, uh, Remy says, usually we see the body oil like this in bodybuilding, yes. Um, Eva, thank you very much. Um, and to think about the way Renee Stout is presenting her body, right? It's, even as some of these Nkisi um, works would be covered in things that could be oily and could be um, viscous, that could add shine to the sculpture. That's not what she does in fetish number two. It is a rough body, right? It is a, um, a body that doesn't try to hide um, the, the chinks in its surface. Um, and then the last one uh, in terms of comparison with Stout. So Micheline Thomas here, um, um, also an artist who's worked with Moat, so I felt like I had to bring her in, in terms of Madame Mama Bush in black and white. Um, so this is her own mother, um, uh, Micheline Thomas's own mother, Sandra Bush, um, nicknamed Mama Bush, who uh, worked in the modeling field in the 1970s, um, you know, uh, was somebody who was interested in the arts, um, enrolled uh, Thomas as a young person um, in art classes, uh, after school programs, according to Micheline, at the Newark Museum in New Jersey and also the Henry Street Settlement. And, um, you know, she says that, you know, a lot of her work started from her mother's encouragement um, as a young person. And that kind of helped her in a way um, get through a rough patch um, um, in terms of their strained relationship as she uh, moved into adulthood. Um, Thomas also talks about um, looking at photography um, by Carrie Mae Weems um, being very influential. This is a Carrie Mae Weems moment um, in terms of Guggenheim exhibitions and well-deserved accolades um, for that contemporary photographer's work. Um, so even as, um, uh, 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 Thomas continued to work in painting, um, we see that um, maybe there's something also that she's learning from Weems in terms of um, 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 sepia toned uh, and black and white photography um, from Weems, um, which is one of some of the works, a series that uh, she's uh, been um, better known for. Uh, and she, you know, working with this kind of chromogenic photograph, I think what um, Micheline Thomas is trying to do is not only to give something that looks um, like it's of a previous era, like the 1970s maybe, and sort of black exploitation kind of maybe film stills or maybe, you know, 
um, uh, forms of um, magazine layouts, including maybe even soft porn, soft porn, soft core pornography, but also um, the ways in which photographers went um, to places in North Africa um, and photographed women in the nude um, in the 19th century, um, not only for documentary photographs, but also in terms of, this is the new nude um, of, uh, of the new era of, uh, of modernity um, in the 19th century. Um, somebody said too that, uh, yes, shine is a specific term associated with a very specific kind of aesthetic theory. Say more about that, Unjung, if you wouldn't mind as we're thinking about it. Because we do see some of the shine in um, this um, photograph, you know, different from the way that uh, Wiley uh, presents it with sleep. Um, and we're thinking, I hope, about, again, not only Thompson in terms of the flash, um, the shine, the reflectivity um, uh, of, uh, of the body here, um, perhaps, and the body as a sculptural form, but shine is this maybe aesthetic. Um, last week, um, I saw one of uh, my colleagues here on the, um, on the, uh, on the uh, call, uh, Becca talking about shine in terms of Krista Thompson saying that that seems to be part of the African diasporic ethic or aesthetic. Um, so I, in terms of all of these works, if we could go to the next slide, uh, Dimitri, I wanted us to just um, uh, remember that I mentioned Adrian Childs's work um, as a curator uh, for this show, Rifts and Relations, African-American Artists in the European Modernist Tradition, which opened um, in the fall of 2020 and was extended um, just until last month. Uh, at the Phillips um, Collection in Washington, D.C. Yeah, thank you for putting that in the chat, um, Dimitri. Um, to think about the ways that, uh, you know, uh, Childs has identified um, African-American artists who are um, most of them uh, historic, the contemporary artists like Faith Ringgold, um, Micheline Thomas is in that exhibition as well, um, who are, are engaging what seems to be maybe like a airtight, locked up European canon of modernism and saying, no, you know, we, we learned this in art school. We've seen these works in museums and in galleries, and we too have something to say about it in terms of how the subjects of that work, especially when they're subjects who are women and the artists are women themselves, especially as people of uh, color, you know, how is it that we can speak back? Um, the cover of the exhibition catalog, as you can see here, um, moves from uh, Matisse to Picasso. And some of you will remember that I talked about um, Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, which um, is in the background there. And there is Picasso on the left side of the margin. Um, the image on the poster to the left is um, uh, Janet Taylor Pickett. Um, also a contemporary artist and her work, um, and she was born, which is clearly borrowing from Matisse interior paintings. Um, just to think about, you know, the body as um, a form that can be used as material itself, I wanted to shift over to Nick Cage. Nick uh, Cave, I always want to call Nick Cage, like Nicholas Cage. Um, Nick Cave um, and one of his sound suits here of 2009. And, you know, he talks about the sound suits um, coming into being as a response to what he was experiencing in terms of racial profiling, um, the the way that people were being um, identified um, by the police, criminalized by the police, obviously based on how they look, based on their exterior. So he starts to, um, to cover the body, right, with um, uh, material, um, uh, artificial material, uh, natural material, um, and, you know, uh, thinking about uh, Kitsan's comment about shine, modern day bling, um, bling as cultural expression, you know, um, it's not so much about 
the shine here, but it's about assemblage, right? It's about accumulation. It's about, um, of course, covering um, the body. Yes, thank you, Yunjun, for jumping in. Shine as terms employed by Afrikober, yes, by um, the Jarrells or Jarrells. I always mispronounce the name. It's Jarrell like Barrel, um, J. Jarrell and Wadsworth Jarrell, right? And extended in discourse by Thompson, yes, bling. So thinking about that kind of ways of um, drawing attention to the body. Remember, we started off even thinking about uh, Zora Neale Hurston's characteristic of Negro expression, right? Um, the ways in which people speak and, and self-present, right? Think about Cave's decision here to, you know, bound up the body or cover the body or, or um, almost um, put the body in a carapace of things with his sound suits. Um, Dorichi, you can hit the next slide. Yeah, so remember that um, his work was seen in the Portraits and Other Likenesses um, exhibition, the collaboration between um, SF MoMA and MOAD um, a couple of years ago. So I wanted to let Cave talk for himself. Um, let's look at the next slide. Um, because I think, um, you know, there's something not only about these sound suits um, in terms of their accumulation and their, and their assemblage, but the ways that they can be used in motion. Um, and that's what the carnival is about. The carnival is this, um, not, it's not a procession, it's actually bodies in motion. Um, so let's hear what Cave um, does in this um, performance of 12 minutes uh, called Chicago. Let's see if we can hit that. Hot link, Dimitri. This place of dreaming within my work really is the place that I find that I exist in most of the time. You know, it's just a sort of amazing state of mind. It is about dreaming for the audience, but I've got to be able to set up those parameters. What do I need to sort of put in place to allow you to dream? I'm based in Chicago. For me, it's an amazing place to be because I can focus. I can have the type of studio that I need. I can introduce a new project here, and there is a network of people that I know here that can help sort of inform and build my work. So it really becomes this interesting sort of laboratory for me. The first sound suit was in 92 in response to the Rodney King incident, the LA riots. I was sitting in the park one day and just sort of thinking about what does it feel like to be discarded, dismissed? profiled, there was this twig on the ground and I looked at that twig as something discarded. And then I proceeded to just start collecting the twigs in the park. And I brought them all back to the studio and then I started to build this sculpture. I would walk this way. I started to realize that the moment I started to move in it, it made sound. Then it just literally put everything in perspective. I was building this suit of armor, something that I could shield myself from the world and society. And so out of that came this sculpture, performative kind of work. I think after the first sound suit, I had a different approach to art making. And I realized that I was an artist with a conscience. 
The moment I did was the moment that my life literally turned upside down. I think it's just me kind of experimenting. It's like, you know, a scientist exploring alternative ideas. How's it look? Oh my God, it looks amazing. I want it to be not necessarily something that is defined. You know, like with the sound suit, I don't draw any of them. If there's areas that are like bad, like put a yellow pen. Okay. I work hard, but I'm one single individual. It was just too much. And so I had to hire three full-time assistants. Now there's, you know, 10 studio assistants that are regular full-time assistants. They're all artists, which is great. I got it. Just the end left. So just, you know, maybe two and a half square feet, so it's about two days. Should be done, you know, Thursday, I think. If I'm coming up with a new concept for a sound suit, I tend to always do the first one myself. It's very meditative for me. I can do it for hours on end. I just need a little bit more. It's all really based on one object that becomes the instigator. That's how sound suit is built. It's built on me sort of identifying an object and then me taking that object and relocating it on and around the body. And then that begins this sort of journey. Metal flowers. A lot of metal flowers. We just did a road trip looking for materials for the body work that I'm working on currently. <laughs> Let's go back here. Look at all the silver. I need to start collecting that. I find that when it comes to looking for supplies for my work, I am at the flea markets, the antique malls, looking for something that may spark a new direction. There's a lot of ducks. No ducks. No ducks. I don't have a list ever. I may not know how I'm going to use it right at the moment. But it all eventually sort of comes back around and enters the work at some point. I'm finding that I'm building work as we're antiquing right on the spot. I may build an entire piece because I will find X here, and then I'll say, okay, I need to find this to go with X. This kind of stuff is nostalgic. It's this place that we want to sort of remember. One day I just started buying these ceramic birds, but you know, I bought them because in my upbringing, that was what was considered precious art. You know, it was kept in this china cabinet and that was my way of staying connected to my grandparents as they were getting older. And it was my way of honoring and sort of celebrating how they influenced my upbringing and my life. So part of the work is really about the sense of honor in the celebratory kind of way that the sound suits are fantastic. Fantastico. I love the colors in this. I'm 
very much interested in being able to create these concepts that I can immerse myself in. Cranbrook Art Museum really became the core of this immersive experience. From that core were these satellite experiences that were built around performance activity. More trotting, more personality, more character, yeah. More energy, more energy, more energy. There can never be enough energy. One of the performances at Cranbrook was really working with the Detroit School of Arts, which is a public high school. I think dance has always been a real critical part of my practice. are really broken up into two bodies of work. One is sculptural work, uh, and that's sort of the static work that, you know, you see in the museums. And then there is this sort of performance uh, sound suits. When producing a project of that scale, all of these components and parts and elements, they're all, it's like building a collage. I think by the end of the project, probably over 500 people were involved in some aspect of the performance. That's what we were interested in making happen in Detroit. How do we get people out of their communities and engaged with the arts? Trayvon Martin is a new work that was shown at Cranbrook. It's made up of a black man again dressed in a hoodie and sneakers and jeans, and then surrounding its body is these plastic blow molds, which are like sometimes at Halloween, there are these plastic forms that are set out in yards. And so they are surrounding this sort of figure almost as guardians. But then over top of the entire structure is this web that's constructed out of pony beads. So from a distance, it looks like this amazing sort of gold sculptural form until you get up close and you realize that there is someone trapped inside. It's very, very disturbing what's going on right now politically within the black community not only Chicago, but around the country, what's going on with police brutality and these unarmed black men that are being killed. I mean, it just goes on and on. You know, I think at the end of the day, it's me giving back to the community and being the sort of change agent. I want to change our way of engaging with one another. I want to use art as a form of diplomacy. That's why I'm in the state of urgency right now. I don't know, I just feel so unsettled. I'm doing what I'm doing, but I'm not sure if it's happening fast enough. Is that Thank it? You, Dimitri. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. So I don't know if folks have, um, you know, things to express about it, but I do think that, um, and we can go to the next slide to just look at the sound suit again, uh, Dimitri. Um, you know, the ways that uh, uh, Cave is doing something that's very formal, that is to say, he said, I picked up this twig and 
you know, I started to make sculpture out of it. Um, he's doing something that is um, um, also uh, responding to uh, what he finds, right? So this idea of using found objects at flea markets at antique stores, et cetera. Um, he's doing something that is um, responsive to um, the political environment in which he's living, which all of us are living as contemporary subjects in terms of racial profiling, um, um, violence, both state violence and um, extra state violence against um, black people. Um, and he says he's doing something to bring people together, right? Um, certainly doing something together, if nothing else, not only the artists that he's employing in the studio um, to help him produce these sound suits, but obviously it's sort of a public um, choreography, you know, as these sound suits move through space. Um, and uh, the ways in which that is um, inherently um, something that is very ancient in terms of um, processions and carnivals and festivals, but in our moment seems utterly postmodernist. That is to say, if the modernists were trying to do something in terms of working things out in terms of painting and sculpture and photography um, to push against certain ideas of um, naturalism um, and in, in art, right, um, the postmodernists take us back to something that seems to be um, a return to the past, the past before modernism, the past of the embodied subject, the past um, that seems to be about ritual and the way things are done, not just the outcome of things. Um, just a reminder, um, uh, I mentioned last week, Root Division, um, if we jump past the Malik City Bay slide, um, to the one that is diasporic uh, futurism. Yeah, um, second Saturday uh, will be virtual for Root Division, which is a gallery here in San Francisco, um, Saturday, February 13, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and the way that the curators for this show are thinking about the idea of diaspora, you might find it interesting um, to attend. Um, the artists will be, some of the artists will be there to talk. The curators will also be logged in as well. It's eight minutes after the hour right now. Uh, should we take a two minute break and then come back and um, talk about carnival? Sound good? All right.
Two minutes went by really fast, huh? <laughs> can take another minute, folks. Okay, so um, quick, quick run through for through Carnival. Um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, Dimitri, for the keywords. Um, um, hopefully we'll be able to see all of these tonight um, in what I'm showing. Um, the uh, thing that I want us to note is, uh, and you saw in the title slide that I talked about carnival as a critique. Um, um, but above all, right, we wanna think about it as a festival. If we go to the next slide, please, Dimitri. Um, so what we have here is um, some word uh, um, etymology about carnival. You can hit um, the uh, advance, please, Dimitri, uh, from the Latin word, um, should be an F there instead of crom, from Latin uh, for taking away or removing meat during the time of sacrifice in regards to the body and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we can hit advance again. Please, Dimitri. So the word uh, carnis from uh, Latin for flesh and vale for farewell. So we're about to hit the uh, Lenten season, right? Uh, February 13, I think, is uh, the first day of, or February 16 is, uh, is Mardi Gras. And we can hit the next slide, please, Dimitri. I uh, just advance, I should say. So the pre-Lenten carnivals are the festival just uh, before the season of Lent, 40 days of abstinence, fasting and penitence in the Christian tradition from Ash Wednesday to Easter. Um, and we can hit the next slide, please, Dimitri. Um, and we should also think about carnivals that may have pre-Christian um, roots, um, like the Saturnalian festival, which is a mid-December carnival, seven days of honoring the ancient god of um, ancient Roman god of agriculture. So carnivals can be um, a, a tied to um, rituals, often des described not only as pre-Christian but pagan. Um, and the next slide, the next uh, bit of text, Dimitri. Um, May Day is a spring um, festival, a spring holiday. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Oh man, there's another typo there. If we could hit advance, please, Dimitri. I'm showing you an, an, um, and hit the next uh, advance too, please, Dimitri. Um, a cropped image here. Uh, if we go back one slide. We can, yeah, a cropped image of a, um, a, a, a print from uh, the 19th century um, in terms of um, Upper Lisson Paddington neighborhood in uh, London from Chapel Street. Um, and then we can go to uh, the enlarged version of it, Dimitri. I just wanted you to see uh, that cropped image so that you could see um, for this May Day image is this sort of vegetal form at the center of this procession. Um, so, you know, celebrating spring um, in European cultures, um, ancient traditions, um, and to see that, um, you know, the idea of um, spring being embodied in this um, assemblage-like form, you know, it just makes us think back to what we just looked at, how Nick Cave sort of um, got his inspiration from looking at organic matter. Um, the scholarship of Judith Bettelheim on um, these carnival traditions, um, among other people like John Nunley um, and Robert Ferris Thompson as well, um, has really um, helped me think about these things. If we can go to the next slide, Dimitri. 
So, you know, just in terms of thinking about carnival as a bunch of people together, you know, I always think about this painting by uh, Bruegel from the 16th century on the fight between carnival and Lent, which is uh, the idea that there's, you know, a battle um, between uh, the carnival season with all of its um, chaos, its enjoyment, and the sort of um, religious piety that um, is of the Lenten season. Um, and, you know, what we get in this scene is, you know, townspeople, as uh, Peter Bruegel is imagining it in, um, in uh, you know, an urban, urine, urban, Euro, urban European setting um, during the Northern Renaissance. Um, and, you know, there are people on the left side who's ju just partying because there's, you know, tomorrow is the next day when you go into the 40 days of, of fasting. And then on the right side of the painting, what you see is uh, people you know, going, coming out of the church, right? So these are the folks who were, you know, saying, you know, we should be, um, we should be pious and, and reserved all throughout the year, not just uh, 40 days of Lent. Um, and I have a little inset here, because I always find this figure funny that's in the bottom center. If you hit advance, please, Dimitri. I love this guy at the center um, who has like a pie on his head, it looks like, and has some meats on a spit um, um, that he's holding. And then he's being pushed um, through the, the square on a barrel, um, probably of uh, something fermented and uh, you know an adult beverage. And then there's a little piece of meat on the a front there as well. Um, so this is probably a figure who's um, part of a sort of a butcher's um, organization, um, a butcher's guild, um, who's just, you know, putting this the pedal to the metal in terms of having a great time um, during uh, the Mardi Gras season. Um, and, I, and, I, and I want us to think about the ways in which um, the idea of the carnival ride is, is not just only about um, having a good time, but also is about um, a political um, um, a political engagement in a way, not just between the pious and the partying, but also among classes. If we can go to the next slide, please, Dimitri. So um, here's a depiction of carnival in, in Trinidad uh, during uh, the 19th century by a British artist who's traveling um, to the Caribbean named Melton Pryor. And what we see here is, you know, carnival is this culture of the street here um, in terms of um, people um, parading down, you know, right down uh, the middle of the street, um, people um, on crowded onto the sidewalks, um, some of whom are clearly masqueraders as well. And I also want you to notice the, um, the, the upper and the lower level. That is to say that there are people looking down at what's going on in terms of the street level. Um, and so um, what we're thinking about is not only the participation, but the idea of observation and the ideas of spectatorship, that there's an audience that's not just looking and watching and evaluating, um, but you know, maybe you know, clapping, maybe yelling, maybe singing, maybe dancing as well. So there's something about masquerading that's not just passive, you know, um, in terms of whatever you're doing, whether you're a costumer like the devil car carnival figure here in um, the prior image, um, you know, look at the ones who are um, uh, wearing wire mask um, and the woman with the fancy dress, you know, these clearly come out of European traditions. Um, some of the masking material was um, imported um, into the Americas. Um, these Austrian uh, wire masks that Judith, Judith Bettelheim has researched. Um, and look at the guys in the sailor suits on the, on the far left. And again, just thinking about what we saw with the Bruegel painting, look on the far right side, you see a guy in a black um, a brimmed hat and a clerical collar, right? He is the, you know, the pious, um, the pious um, figure, not one like what we saw in terms of the Bruegel painting, trying to be above all of this, um, this uh, frivolity and um, presumably right licentiousness as well. Um, if we can hit the advanced slide, Dimitri, I just wanted to bring in the name of uh, Mikhail Bakhtin and the idea of the carnivalesque. So for Bakhtin, right, this idea of the carnivalesque is about um, the bi-level, as I've just mentioned, in terms of the two levels in which people are watching and some people are being watched. Um, the carnival in terms of um, 
the, a popular force, right? That something's going on with masses of people in urban streets that sort of flips the everyday order, at least for you know the days of the carnival period. Um, uh, uh, Bakhtin laid this out in his dissertation um, that he wrote in the 1940s, um, but it was not accepted by his, um, his academic department um, because it was seen as um, controversial in terms of talking about political order. He was interested in the work of Rabelais, um, the, uh, the French uh, playwright and author, and he talked about Rabelais' uh, Rabelais ideas of um, the body, um, the grotesque, um, satire, um, just, you know, a little bit of out of the box, right, sort of popular expression. Um, so, you know, the carnivalesque um, for Bakhtin um, was something that he saw in Rabelais' writing, as well as the grotesque in terms of things that were seen, again, out of the norm, out of, um, out of the box in a lot of ways. Um, in terms of what's going on in Trinidad, Let's see here, what's the next slide I have here? Um, let's look at the next slide, please, Dimitri. So among the kind of characters of Trinidadian Carnival, which is a carnival that really um, influenced a lot of the diasporic carnivals, Notting Hill Carnival, which we'll talk briefly about in London, uh, the Toronto Carnival um, in uh, Canada, um, uh, carnival uh, in New York, um, where I grew up seeing carnival in Brooklyn, um, to some extent the carnival in um, here in San Francisco. Um, what we see here is um, a figure that's um, identified with the sailor um, carnival figure, that is to say um, someone who is trying to um, take on the look of the sailor as the white sailor, the white European sailor um, coming to uh, the Caribbean in the 19th century um, and uh, covering the face with powder that both sort of gives the image of a white or European American or Europe Amer European subject. Um, the powder is also this cooling um, uh, um, uh, uh, substance as well when you think about the heat of Trinidad. I hope you're thinking and seeing in the background the steel band, so you might be even thinking about the music of these 55 gallon drums that have been transformed into instruments. Um, the steel band comes up um, because um, of, of, of um, the, uh, the state in the 19th century in Trinidad trying to um, clamp down on um, people of color, people of African descent in particular, um, participating in carnival by playing drums so, um, and uh, performing music. So a lot of times um, people uh, would be uh, using discarded objects again, um, you know, pots and pans would be transformed into instruments. And the steel drum um, or steel pan, as it should be rightly called, um, comes up in the 1930s um, where people get these big oil drums because Trinidad is one of the world's biggest oil producing um, economies. Um, so drums of, uh, of, um, of emptied uh, drums of oil could be used and recycled and made into instruments. Um, the, the sailor becomes, you know, not only um, a figure of, uh, of authority and maybe a figure of parody, um, especially because there were a lot of sailors in uh, 20th century Trinidad um, stationed in Trinidad, a US base, um, 1930s and 40s, right? And a little bit of um, American imperialism in this hemisphere. So um, there's, there's a bit of critique, I think, going on here with the sailor uh, character as being performed by this masquerader in Trinidad. On the next slide, please, Dimitri. And you know, thinking about um, you know what happens in um, these celebrations um, before Mardi Gras, they talk about the um, Juve celebration, which comes from the French word um, for uh, the opening of the day, so jour ouvert, right? So this idea of before you get to the Mardi Gras full blast revelry, right? There is also um, nighttime um, revelry that goes into the early morning of the day and then into the um, 
into the times of, um, of the, the day long processions. So we see here um, two celebrators here in Trinidad on the left, um, 2009, and then um, a celebrator in um, Brooklyn, New York, 2012. Um, like I said, where I grew up seeing um, uh, um, um, carnival because I grew up right on that street of Eastern Parkway. Um, and what I want you to notice too is um, again the body being slicked down, the body being um, becoming this sort of sensual, um, sensualized um, object, um, the sort of homoeroticism of it, right, in terms of carnival is a time where um, the sort of um, breakdown of sort of the um, the strictures that would prevent men from hugging, um, wearing women's clothing, um, showing their bodies um, juxtaposed to each other breaks down because in Carnival, everything is possible. Everything opens up. Um, I also want you to see in the background um, the way that people um, are using flags in the Caribbean carnivals. So even as Trinidad is um, the carnival that um, seems to influence a lot of these overseas diasporic carnivals. Um, you see people come out and speak of their heritages. And I think these are Grenadians um, behind um, this fellow on the right here, um, based on what I can see of the color of the flag. If you go to the next slide, um, you know, I'm just giving you a little uh, key here in terms of all the um, Caribbean flags and I can, you know, wave my uh, Jamaican flag um, here like I used to do on the parkway um, back in the day. Next slide, please, Dimitri. So speaking of Jamaican traditions, um, you know, there's a tradition of the John Canoe character um, in Jamaica um, and you're seeing here um, uh, some prints made by uh, Isaac Belisario, um, who traveled to the Caribbean in the 19th century. And what I want you to see both um, is these um, costumes that this figure um, of John Canoe is dressed in. So these are based on street performers um, who would uh, come out during carnival and during other times of the year. So um, what's great is the one on the left, you see the way the figure's lifting up his um, wire mask, which would have the physiognomy of a white person to show the black body underneath it. On the right is the astonishing um, House John Canoe figure. Remember that image of this person with a, um, a, a plantation house as a headdress um, atop his head. Um, the, the name John Canoe um, was uh, believed um, uh, to be connected to a Ghanaian um, military leader who fought against um, the European forces that were um, uh, coming into uh, West Africa in uh, uh, the 18th century, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, pushing back against imperial and colonizing forces. Um, so that's where we think uh, the idea of John Canoe, which has been anglicized into John Canoe there um, in terms of this figure as an idealized figure, as well as a performing figure. Um, on the right, if we can advance the slide, you'll see um, John Canoe performers, and you can hit the advance again to Jamaica, uh, um, in Jamaica here, thanks Dimitri. Um, these are celebrants because John Canoe is a Christmas festival happening after what's um, considered in the Anglo um, traditions, the UK traditions, Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, where people go around having spent Christmas with the family, they go around on the 26th and go to other people's houses. Um, times you can give your tradesmen a little something um, to thank them for their service during the year, the mailmen, the milkmen, et cetera. And in John Canoe um, traditions, this is a time where people also go out on the street in these um, costumes. So you see here what's a, a John Canoe, um, a roots band John Canoe. That is to say, their um, uh, costumes very look very um, um, not as fancy as say the fancy John Canoe images of Belisario on the left. They look um, like they're pulled together um, using whatever is at hand, um, even as they try to um, replicate um, in terms of the mask-like um, figures here, the, the sort of fancy wire mask of um, the fancier John Canoe traditions. If we go to the next slide, please, Dimitri. Uh, let's look at uh, the video, if we can, of a John Canoe celebration in um, 21st century Jamaica in Kingston. It's at the bottom of the page. Yeah, thank you, Dimitri. 
it'll um, open up in a second too, so. I'm loving that um, because uh, not only do you get a sense of um, even with the small band of people, right? Remember I said that carnival is like taking over the street. The car is coming. They're not like, oh, wave, let me slow down this car. They're like, you, we're going to be in the street. You know, you're not going to hit us. This is our time. 
Um, and you get a sense of the John Canoe dance, like these um, sort of contortions of the bodies and limbs, very, um, you know, subtle movements, um, talking about them in the 19th century, people talked about John Canoe's dance, as we saw in the Belisario um, images that just preceded this slide, uh, was recognized as um, strange contortions of the body and limbs, um, small rapid crossings of the legs several times repeated and then terminating in a stopping. Um, the other thing that we can see is common, um, both in terms of what we saw in the video, as well as um, these images here, um, is the kind of music you hear, um, fife and drum music. Um, you also hear like the scrapers, the banjo, tambourine, the shakers. Um, so these are um, uh, people who are moving not only um, to a number of different melodies, but obviously are using the costumes themselves to show off a kind of movement. Um, Robert Farris Thompson talks about this as a high affect aesthetic in terms of dancing that shows off not only what you can see visually, but also what you can hear. Um, I hope you saw some of the costumes, um, not only in terms of the rags, the sort of what they call the pitchy patchy um, um, uh, costuming. We can go to the next slide, as a matter of fact, to see some of these kind of performers. Um, the ones with the, um, the rags there on the one on the left, far right, um, you can see that um, there is a performer with a sort of as if he's wearing um, strips of rag cloth there. That's called the pitchy patchy. Um, the look is like just pitches and patches of clothes that have been stripped apart. Um, the third character in the middle also in a sort of pitchy patchy character. And what's really cool about um, the image that's on the left is you have the um, young boy here who's the apprentice in this Roots John Canoe band. Um, so learning from his elders. Um, the figure there at the, um, in the left there is um, seen as an Indian figure. If we can go, uh, that, yeah, right there with the stick um, um, is seen as a wild Indian. You see a figure that is um, a devil in black here um, on the left as well. Um, and you see a figure that's called the horse head character. Um, so these are literally um, supposed to reflect the sort of equine population in Jamaica, including um, things like mules and donkeys. Um, so using what's there in terms of what's real to that environment as part of the diasporic movement here um, in terms of what we're seeing in Jamaica. The other thing I wanted you to notice, um, and I know that the slide is a little bit, um, the, the, um, the text got uh, cropped around, is on the right here is a mix of um, fancy John Canoe dress and roots dress um, performers. So the woman in the white is sort of a, like a bride's made um, a virginal figure that would be considered the fancy dress performer, as opposed to the horse head, which seems much of the roots um, tradition in terms of the um, use what you can around you as, as opposed to the fine cloth of the bride's dress. And notice the little green figure there. That's another kind of um, Jack in the green like figure like what we saw in the May Day performance in London. And this is everywhere, right? The sort of vegetal um, character that, you know, pays homage to the natural world. Um, let's see, what else do I wanna say about Jamaica? Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, of course, when we think of carnivals and masquerade, we do think, of course, of Mardi Gras in uh, New Orleans. Um, what we know do now, though, is that um, Mardi Gras actually started in terms of the United States in um, Mobile, Alabama, not in New Orleans. Um, so the first celebrations um, were um, outside of the city of New Orleans to, you know, the city where Mardi Gras is the synonym um, for New Orleans. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing here in this image is, um, again, people taking over the street. Um, we see the familiar um, procession of one of these crews, um, Rex here. Um, is uh, leading. Um, notice that their theme seems to be something like Adam and Evie um, on the float um, is a nude woman and, you know, um, a replication of a tree with a snake over there. So the sort of Christian um, beginnings, right, of the fall here is the symbol, is the theme um, that's being taken up. Um, also, of course, in New Orleans and um, um, elsewhere in Louisiana, because there are um, carnival traditions 
um, in Baton Rouge are the Mardi Gras, the Black Mardi Gras um, uh, Indians. If we can go to the next slide, Dimitri. So um, these are Indians who started to, that is to say, these are maskers who started to masquerade, to play mass in the Caribbean phrase, playing masquerade. Um, is uh, these uh, performers started in the 19th century, that is to say people of African descent who um, decided to make and wear um, um, Plains Indian, mostly styled um, uh, influenced um, costumes as part of their masquerade um, uh, tradition and masquerade um, um, custom. Um, on the left, you see um, uh, Tutti Montana of the Yellow Pocahontas tribe um, in his um, regalia um, of um, sometime in the 1970s, I think um, this photograph was taken. And I want you to just notice what's going on with um, one of his contemporaries, that is to say, um, Larry Bannock there on the right. So Bannock, it's not only the difference between um, a costume that is bluish green turquoisey of Montana's that I want you to see on the left, but also the, um, the ways in which the paneling is um, presented. So look at the, um, the design on uh, Montana's um, uh, um, um, uh, front there. Um, it's um, geometric. It is, um, it is non-representational. Um, it is um, symbolic. Um, yes, it's about beads and rhinestones, etc. cetera. Um, and compare the yellow costume of um, Larry Bannock from the Golden Star Hunters on the right. So um, the two styles are contrasted based on where these performers um, were affiliated with. That is to say the downtown style of Montana is seen as more geometric and abstract than the uptown style of Bannock. Um, what I want you to notice too is if you can on the yellow costume of Banna, you'll see a representation of a figure. It's supposed to be um, sort of the Indian in, um, in contemporary dress, blue jeans and red shirt. So there's a, an aspect of representationalism with the Bannock um, um, costume there uh, that isn't part of the downtown style of Tutti Montana. Um, so we're getting close to the top of the hour. What else do you want to say about it? Let's go to the next slide, Dimitri. Thanks. Um, so um, I don't think I'll play this video, but I do want you to see that there are new um, groups coming up in um, New Orleans um, Black Mardi Gras tradition all the time. Um, this is a group called the Young Maasai Hunters. Um, there's a video online, it's about seven minutes, a little over seven minutes long to check it out. And you'll see that the kind of distinctions between downtown and uptown um, sort of collapse a little bit in the more contemporary um, uh, New Orleans um, Black Mardi Gras Indians traditions. Um, and then the next slide just so we get in under the wire. Um, in terms of Trinidad and um, late 19th century, um, late 20th century performers, the most well-known of them is um, uh, an artist named Peter Minchel. So what Minchel is doing is creating these moving choreographed performances. Um, this one is from uh, his River Trilogy that he started in 1983. And you see two characters um, in his, um, part of the central part of this performance, uh, the man crab and the washerwoman. We can um, hit the advance, um, Dimitri. So the man crab figure is this, um, uh, a king-like figure in his, uh, in this performance, um, this part of the first part of the trilogy, who is presenting a sort of, um, another battle between good and evil. So the man crab is the king figure who is um, exemplifying the destructive acts of modern life. Um, and he's pilloried or pitted against, if we can hit the slide, um, Dimitri, the washerwoman, right? So this is a struggle between a man crab who's like a Lucifer-like figure and evil of technology. And you can see the sort of Star Wars um, sort of costume that this um, performer is wearing, um, who's get against the washerwoman, who's about purity and 
and harmony with nature. And of course, the idea of cleanliness, right? And, and, and um, what's the word I want? Uh, cleanliness and uh, sanit sanitation, I guess, for lack of a better word. So what, uh, what he's done with these costumes is he's created these dynamic kinetic costumes, which we've seen in these carnival traditions before, but with the man crab one, it's this huge um, contraption in which um, um, a red liquid is pumped into the pillows, the canopy above all of that metal there to um, represent blood which is the blood of the washerwoman when the washerwoman is defeated by man crab. So, you know, it's destruction is the end of it all. And, you know, part of what's going on with Minchel is he's thinking about in the late 20th century, how Trinidad, because of its oil and gas reserves, is this extremely um, rapidly um, uh, um, country of wealth. And he's talking about the sort of conspicuous displays of wealth. He's talking about um, people being um, greedy and dishonest. So this, this is a sort of allegory for contemporary Trinidad circa the 1980s. Um, if we can hit the advance button one more time, uh, Dimitri. Um, man crab and uh, washerwomen um, also have a third character that's being contended with is um, this character called Callaloo and that figure has these kind of wing-like apparatuses. So these incredibly um, um, creative uses of um, sequins and wings. Um, the figure is supposed to be one that can walk on water um, that is going to be the spirit of the forest that may be able to revive um, the Trinidadian not only nation, but the soul of Trinidad in Peter Minchel's um, thinking about this time in the late 20th century. Um, next slide is just an image of what the, the street looks like in terms of, um, of the Caribbean carnival, um, not only in Trinidad, but in a lot of other places. Um, you can go online and see um, uh, videos of Caribbean carnival. And it, again, it's not about just standing on the side of the street and watching people process, um, which is my point of what has happened in a lot of the Caribbean carnivals in the diaspora. So more and more because of litigation and other things, right? There are barricades, um, there are streets blockaded off. And the whole point in the Bakhtinian sense of the carnival is that you can't have all of that constriction. You're in the carnival as, a par as, a, as well as watching people with their costumes, with their musical instruments, right? There's no separation. I'm going to go to the next slide. So there were riots, uh, racialized riots, um, where um, a conservative political parties were um, ginning up um, supporters, centers, not just London, but elsewhere. So there was um, um, a racist riot. I hate to use these words race riot because they're, they're just euphemisms. There's racist riots in August of 1958 um, in the Notting Hill neighborhood, which is now, you know, a very posh neighborhood. Um, we remember maybe the Hugh Grant movie of the 1990s set in Notting Hill. It's a gentrified neighborhood, but in the uh, 1950s, it was a working class and working poor neighborhood um, with a lot of of um, poor people um, and working class people, including people of African descent, some who had been in London for generations and some who were new arrivals who came in the 1940s after World War II, having been lured to um, London and other major cities in the United Kingdom um, in, for the promise of work in the factories after World War II. Um, another person who was in London at that time was Claudia Jones. Um, she had been born in Trinidad in 1915, had lived in the United States. She was an activist, um, a journalist, a writer. Uh, she was an open Communist Party member, which got her um, imprisoned by the United States government four times in the 1940s um, and into the 1950s. Um, 
uh, she had a heart attack in a prison and finally the um, United States government decided that they were going to deport her and the UK decided that they were going to take her in. Um, she gets to, to the UK um, in the mid 1950s and she starts a newspaper and that's a photograph of what I'm showing you there, the newspaper that she established called the West Indian Gazette. Um, in response to the um, race racist riots in Notting Hill in 1958, Claudia Jones says, what are we going to do to get this take care of? What can we do to make people feel, especially the people who are the victims of these racist attacks, um, like they have something that they can hold on to because there's catch and hell in hand basket in Britain. So she and other community leaders decide to have um, Caribbean carnivals inside because it's cold in London <laughs> during the UK, during the Lenten season and during the, even the John Canoe season, they were going to go Chris Carnival. But they have it inside. Dimitri, we can go to the next slide, please. Is it, st is it sticking? Uh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, Yes, that's, uh, is there one right before that or right after that? Let's try one more after it. Okay. Okay, we can stick with that one. I'll go to the next one. So the other thing, so 1959, there's a carnival inside in St. Pancras um, Town Hall in London. And we'll see in a second people enjoying that um, carnival inside in 1959. Um, in 1959, unfortunately, another thing happens which absolutely um, crushes the spirit of um, people of conscience, including people of African descent in the in the London communities is that a, a man who's working as a carpenter named Kelso Cochran, um, who has come to England. Um, he's working as carpenter. He was born in Antigua. He's working as a carpenter to save up money to go to law school. Is coming home after um, being in the hospital emergency room one night. Um, he hurt his hand on his job. He's working as a carpenter. And he's set upon by um, some white racist men who um, stab him and um, um, the wounds are fatal and he died. And it's an extremely, um, you know, it's not only about the loss of this uh, man who's come to uh, England in order to better himself and for a better life, but the police refuse to treat it as a crime. Um, they want to speak about it's just an ordinary robbery um, and the racism had no part of it. So um, people are in the streets um, protesting and they're saying, you know, what does it take for the police to, to um, honor white human life here? So. Uh, Claudia Jones says in 1959, after the racist murder of Kelso Cochran, let's do another carnival again inside. Um, so we can go to the next slide. If it's going to advance. So here are some of the protesters um, talking about Ken Kessel Cochran's murder in, um, in Notting Hill where he was living. And here are some of the um, carnival um, documentation photographs of carnival um, um, people, uh, carnival celebrants in 1959 and in 1960. So, after the murder of Kelso Cochran in 1959, there's another carnival in 1960. And if you hit the advance button one more time, uh, Dimitri. I think all these animations are slowing it down. Uh, what I'm just pointing you out for you is that the BBC purportedly um, um, did a live broadcast of the 1960 carnival. Um, what I've been chasing for probably five years now is a copy of that actual broadcast. I've gotten so far as, um, because I've been able to get into the BBC archives, is find the script of it. So, you know, to me, there's a lot of um, 
important documentation of the carnival itself, the Notting Hill Carnival, which is now Europe's biggest street festival. But I'm interested um, in looking at these kind of images to say what people were doing in these intimate interior spaces before carnival went out into the street, because I think these are also important diasporic performances and diasporic uh, cultural actions that are about, um, you know, bringing something from home to the new home. You know, this to me is the epitome of diasporic performance carried in the body and then adapted to the new place. If we go to the next slide, we get to what everybody talks about. I mean, I love going to um, Notting Hill Carnival, um, which is um, the subject of a book. If we go to the next one. and go beyond this one. Is this the right one? Great. Uh, a publication that came a couple years ago, really speaking of what is the, con the, the contemporary, yes, it is. Thank you so much, Dimitri. The contemporary Notting Hill Carnival, that is to say, oh, one more behind it. If we go back in reverse. Just one behind it, we hit first. Jackie, the one that says carnival in yeah, red? It's great. Um, you know, the people arguing, when was the first Notting Hill carnival? So different than the one, yeah, perfect. That's it, you got it. So this is a carnival that starts off either in 1964 with Children's Parade, which was organized by a woman from, um, uh, she's from the Netherlands named Ron Lossett, Lossett, who is living in um, Notting Hill. She's a white woman of color neighborhood and says, what can you do? Let's have a, a children's carnival because who would, who would, who would, um, who would have anything against children putting on costumes and being part of a, a celebration um, during um, uh, some time of the year when everybody needs to think about something else. Um, and this carnival explodes in terms of what becomes in the 1960s, not only steel pan performances like you see at the bottom right, um, but brings people from across um, Europe to um, Notting Hill, crowding this neighborhood. People complain about it in terms of that's when they get away on um, that weekend. And what you should also see is the engagement between the police who were rightfully condemned for not um, investigating Kelso Cochran's murder, um, being part of the celebration, um, dancing with um, uh, um, people who are part of the carnival masquerades, joking around in terms of um, the woman at the bottom right who has on the policeman's, um, the Bobby's cap, and the guy in the middle there who's um, got on um, a was recognizably a Rastafarian's knitted cap atop his Bobby helmet. Um, if we go to the next slide, Dimitri, just hit advance. Oh, there was something right before it, but I don't think it loads it up. Um, uh, it just is an, um, an image of, of, yeah. So riots happen again in the 1970s and 80s because of racist attacks. Remember, this is not only the age of, um, of, of right-wing attacks um, where um, people from conservative parties in Britain are literally ginning up people, um, but they're also very anti-immigrant attacks and every black and brown person is seen as an immigrant, even when people have been there for generations. And even if they came the day before, um, there's no reason for them to be seen as um, outsiders who have no place there. Um, if we go to the next image, so this is where Yes, um, uh, there's a, been a production um, of four um, um, episodes of a series called Small Acts. Um, you might want to check it out by the acclaimed um, Steve McQueen, who uh, won the Academy Award a couple of years ago, Best Director for 12 Years a Slave. Um, this is one of his projects. And he talks about this period in London um, uh, during the uh, 60s and 70s of um, um, racist attacks and, um, and just police persecution of people of Black 
um, and African descent. And next slide, which is the final one, because we are at the top of the hour. Um, just to show you Tam Joseph, um, a Dominican born um, artist, and that is Dominica in the Caribbean, talking about the ways in which the police are there purportedly to protect the carnival um, um, uh, 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 participants and celebrants. And yet um, there's a sense of which the, the carnival participants are the target of aggression, of over-policing, and then never safety when it's needed. Um, Tam Joseph is a, a living artist um, who um, rightfully has um, been celebrated for this um, collage work um, that speaks to that moment of the 1980s. And the very last one, um, just to underscore my point with the next slide, is, um, you know, this is closer to our time, um, a Juve carnival celebration in Notting Hill, and this body that, you know, refused to, 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 to suppress um, this moment um, of celebration, albeit outside of the carnival season, right? What That's what happens with a lot of these diasporic carnivals that um, start off as pre-Lenten season carnivals in Europe, in Canada, in the United States, especially in New York. It's too cold to get half naked during the carnival season. So all of these carnivals move toward um, the summer season and are usually timed with a bank holiday. Um, in Britain, it's in August. In Brooklyn, it's in uh, September. In um, Canada, it's also in August. So it's after the hour and the last slide will just be some key words, um, just so we're thinking about them as we finish up the course. Um, it's been so great to think about, um, you know, these concepts of um, Black artists production and the idea of the Black Atlantic um, with you for um, four incredible weeks. And I just want to encourage you to keep looking at these kinds of traditions and these productions and, you know, there is so, so much that's there um, for us to be thinking about and talking about thanks to um, these incredibly um, creative artists. Really appreciate being engaged with you about the work. Thanks so much, Jackie. This has been so incredible. You are amazing. And I just love everyone's um, sprinkling you with, with so much gratitude right now. I know, I know. Thank you, everybody. It's just been so great. And find us, you know, come find me at California College of the Arts and let's keep talking about it. This is totally amazing, um, incredibly deep work to consider and amazing ideas. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. All right, everyone have a wonderful evening. Jackie, I'll see you soon. Thank you all. <laughs> Good night. Always amazing. Good night. <laughs>